Hi guys, welcome back to Will Debate Reviews. Today we're going to talk about Powers of Ten, Issue 6, of course, written by Jonathan Hickman with art by R.B. Silva. This was, once again, a fantastic issue, just like all the other issues of both House of X and Powers of Ten have been. This one finally gives us a answer to a big question that has been going on for a while ever since uh, House of X issue 2 the third issue in this uh, 12 issue intertwining of two mini series and we also get uh, some other cool little nuggets going on in here uh, as the sun sets on powers of X and powers of 10 and House of X and the sun gets to rise again next week on Dawn of X kicking off six now seven new ongoing series it was announced at New York Comic Con this last weekend that Wolverine would be uh, joining uh, the Dawn of X as the seventh title starting in February, which I think is really cool. So let's dive into this. As always, there is going to be a ton of stuff to unpack. I will probably miss stuff, but that's what the comments section is for. You guys always leave me a ton of great comments. I'm blowing up my phone late Wednesday and then all throughout the day on Thursday. I love it. Thank you all. All right. So first off, always got that quote in there, and now we build from Professor X. Love it. Love it. All right, so we go back to this opening scene here that we've seen before, and I love this. Just one sheeter of Xavier walking out of the woods looking dope in his three-piece suit. Love it. Um, so he's at the carnival where we've seen before, and basically all of this stuff is stuff that we've seen before. Um, I think it was in, I don't forget what issue it was in, but we've seen it all before, them kind of meeting, and Moira saying, um, it's not a dream if it's real, Charles, and then basically telling him to uh, uh, read her mind, and this is when he has the realization, right? And that's when stuff starts to get interesting. So we go back to uh, year 1000, and we're at a place called The Preserve, and it looks very very garden of edenish i love the color palettes we got some elephants there um the sun setting in the background very very good and then the librarian shows up and there's like this um like floating uh piece of tech along with the librarian and the librarian just kind of sighs and says uh the aggression is pointless and you know says um, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm, I am very smart, super smart. Uh, please just get out of here and, and go eat. I mean, you no harm. And in the preserve, Wolverine is there. Yes, Wolverine is still alive in year 1000. And so then uh, the librarian tells him, but you have no more time, Logan howled at James. And then, uh, Wolverine says, oh, because he's been speaking in like a different language. And he says, oh, you're speaking in English now. And I love this. He says, I'm the librarian. Dead languages fascinate me. Oh, English is dead. Okay. He says, especially ones that haven't been spoken in centuries. I downloaded it uh, some time ago in hopes we might have an honest conversation, a nuanced one. And he's, uh, Logan's like, <laughs> Logan's Logan. He says, get on with it. Let's just do this. I was waiting on her and her is moira right and so um moira says that that's the problem you've been eavesdropping on us and he says observation is one of the primary reasons for controlled habitats such as these preservation of course is the excuse we all hide behind that was that's a pretty powerful line right there uh, after all we wouldn't want to see the last group of mutants on the planet go extinct would we so there were some others that we saw in the background plus moira and and wolverine uh, being these last mutants in the year 1000 he says, uh, but I love this, he says, uh, but if I'm getting truthful, the real get for someone in my position is watching how the two of you have responded to various stimuli I've introduced over time. What's that ancient phrase? I wanted to see what makes you tick. Wolverine, how's that working out for you? Great stuff. And so this then is where he kind of... Uh, fills them in on everything that's about to happen with the phalanx and this is where stuff gets interesting so basically says the phoenix will absorb uh the entirety of our post-human society all that we are all that we have done everything that we've known to become the collective and then go join a god intellect a dominion and everything we know will be loaded up there like we've learned about over the past few issues that's when moyer was like oh the world is ending tomorrow and he's like yeah 
it is. And Logan's like, and we're all going to die? And he says, almost everyone will die. The possible exception is you. You I have arranged to send off planet. And Moira asks why. And he says, and I'm, I'm going to read a bit, a bit here because this is very interesting. He says, I think you know why. From what I've gathered observing you, if you die before our phalanx makes it to the nearest black hole, then all that I know will not become a part of the Dominion. Uh, I think it says over here um, somewhere that it, the, um, the, yes, when you join the phalanx, or when you join the Dominion, when the phalanx joins a Dominion, it exists outside of space and time. That's very key, right? Um. He says here, if you die before our phalanx makes it to the nearest black hole, then all, then all that I know will not become a part of the Dominion. And when you, when you annihilate this timeline or reality, then you'll be back right where you started, knowing what you know uh, without us knowing anything. So, But if you live because, past my becoming a god, then existing beyond space and time, we will know you forever. And I think it very likely we would not tolerate something like you having a power over something like us. So this has been the significance of the year 1000, which we found out something else about it here in a minute, is that the fail or this kind of post-human society, which we find out here in a few pages, has kind of been like this uh, post-human society flipping back and forth between human evolution and machine evolution, kind of hopping itself up the evolutionary chain. And now it's at its ultimate peak, right? The machines want to have this ultimate realization they have figured out how to beat moira and that's because they've reached this place where they can ascend and the phalanx will accept them and they can go and join a dominion in one of those uh network of black holes um that exist outside of space and time so the machines would know how to always defeat mutants no matter how many times moira or some other force reset the timeline and you know put everything back to zero the phalanx and the intelligence would always know how to beat mutants which is a fantastic idea and it it gives a huge great reason for everything that that's been happening and i love this artwork in these last panels right here as this you know person uh the librarian is in the shadows and then you see one of these uh Krakoan flowers you know slowly come into play as he picks it and his eyes get narrower and narrower and just so much more sinister just hiding in the shadows i love it so so much and so moira you know, of course, Wolverine's like, oh, screw you. And Moira's like, let him finish. And he says, um, it's a fair question. No, why would I tell you? Why would I be conflicted? My question is this. Uh, I question the wisdom of it because becoming something that's just an idea uh, of existence, something immaterial. And he's like almost wrestling with the idea of adjoining the failings and losing any sort of corporealness, right? He says, um, um, then Moira asks, you want me to convince you to do it? He says, yes. How would you prevent it? With all you've learned in your many lives, how would you stop us from losing our post-humanity and surrendering to the machines? Basically, like, prodding her. It's like, if you, we allowed you to live and, or, you know, die and reset everything, how would you go about this? And Wolverine's like, oh, I got this one. Maybe we go back and start that revolution I was talking about a little bit sooner, right? Got to pop off that uh um <laughs> that revolution then we get a new name for it says uh homo novi novasomia no novasomia i'm probably pronouncing that wrong whatever <laughs> um and so um and i love this he says look around you moira Ken kenross see the cage the cage is inevitable but you being outside of it is not inevitable which whew, it's like there's always going to be a cage. It's just, it's just a matter of what side of the cage you're going to be on. And he says, um, mutants are the next response, are an evolutionary response to an environment. You are naturally occurring the next step in human evolution. But what happens when humanity stops being beholden to its environment? And so that's when he starts talking about how humans used artificial intelligence and machines to gain themselves time he says them the sentinels gained them years nimrod gained them decades i love it so much and moira has the revelation so she says i never saw it i never saw that this is what was keeping us down right 
And he says, and I guess you never will. After all, if you aren't capable of recognizing the real enemy you faced, how could you ever defeat them? Maybe this is just how it ends for you, and if you have no and if you have no real alternative to offer, maybe this is my fate as well. Immortality, divinity, as I have no choice to become a small part of a god. Right, right. And that's when Wolverine does the Wolverine thing and just pins him to a tree with his claws. I absolutely Love it. And so now they've figured it out. And I love this. Wolverine says, Dear Lord, up in Robot Heaven, tell me, was that fast enough for you? Because the librarian was bragging earlier about everything um, he knows. He's like, oh, I'm too fast for you. I'm super smart and I'll figure it out. Right. I love it. And that's when Moira was like, okay, you got to send me on my way. We got to do this thing again. And the caption says, and so ended the sixth life of Moira acts and so after that we'll get into some more stuff but i want to flip back over um to this book that blew all of our minds um and this is where um everything happened right so um you know they were they had their utopia in life five um and then or they had their utopia in, in life four they had all of these again sentinels they had their utopia in life five and then that's where this book so many or two two and a half months ago skipped life five and she says it says moira spent the entirety of her seventh life eradicating the trask bloodline boulevard donald gwyneth right and went through all of them and then that's when she made the realization that artificial intelligence um, it's like fire, it's discovery, not an intention. And so um, all she was doing was succeeding from Trask being the one that discovered it, right? And that artificial intelligence was always going to happen and says that's when it radicalized her. So in her eighth life, what she did was went to Magneto and Magneto raged and that's what eventually caused the end of everything. And then in her ninth life, that's when she uh, aligned herself with Apocalypse, you know, trying to always find the more powerful thing to go up against humans and technology. And of course, we saw the uh, the end of the ninth life with Rasputin and Cardinal and all of that, which was just so fantastic. I I really hope we get Car or, uh, Rasputin back at some time. And then that's when we go into the 10th life back on this park bench in, in the carnival, right? And that's where that one ended. So let's flip back over here. Now that we have a little bit more context of Moira's 6th life was the one where she realized um, technology and artificial intelligence was going to be the downfall of, of mutantdom and kind of this flip-flopping of uh, of humanity is evolution, right? There's um, this chart right here, and it says uh, Homo noviosa nova novasomia is the post humanity is a manufactured branch of humanity and not restricted by normal evolutionary constraints. It says the problem with technology based post evolutionary state is the inevitable but naturally occurring paradigm loop between organic and technical constructs, right? That flipping back and forth of or of humans versus technology, humans versus technology, and it goes on and on and on, which they are always trying to keep down Homo superior, right? I love this page over here. We get the, the, the kind of the next page of Xavier after he reads Moyer's mind, and it just it breaks Xavier's brain so, so much. Um, this page, this page almost, you know, breaks your heart, right? He said, Xavier's like, what, what did you just show me? And she's like, yeah, it's a bit much, I agree, uh, that it cuts at everything you believe even more so. Still, hard truths are, are what's called for when dealing with radical alignments of old to old ways of thinking. And you can just see the look on Xavier's face right here when he says, we lose? We always lose? And then she says, no, or she says, no, it's much worse than that. We always lose. And then he's, you know, doing the Xavier thing. He says, perhaps if I were more selective with my students, maybe if I picked better X-Men, maybe we would win. Then she just basically stops him with a kiss um, and says, um, <laughs> you know, I love this. She says, um, I've loved you, I've hated you, and all the emotional complexities in, in between, and not once in all my lives have you changed. And he says, thank you. And then she savagely fires back. 
it's not a compliment because he's part of why they always lose, right? He says, uh, you're a good man who believes in the goodness of others, and it breaks my heart that I have to break that part of you, but I will break it because that's what has to happen now. I will fight you just like your shade, Eric, will fight me, and I love calling Magneto the shade to Xavier because Xavier is the light, uh, or, you know, the presumed good side right the light to the dark the um the, the light to the, the shadow that is eric the good and the bad the two sides of the same coin i just love that particular word use it's just so so striking right and she says you've been dreaming the wrong dream charles and it's a long time to wake um to pa it's long past time for you to wake up Great stuff. All right, now we get some very interesting stuff in Moira's journal. Of course, some of it's redacted. It wouldn't be one of these comics without something redacted, something to, to play with later. And so she kind of goes through kind of an evolution of um, or progression of her dealings with with Xavier. So entry five, um, I love this. It's painful how hopeful and idealistic he remains. It's shameful how much he wants to love these people, presumably talking about humans. He will learn. Um, I love that. And then 14, uh, I have a choice to make up until now. I've been lying to myself about what I am, what I am and what I am not capable of. And just talking about um, how she's worried about breaking Xavier. And she says, if I do break him, how will he become the man I need him to be? In the coming days, uh, she's had has a breakthrough with Xavier with Charles. Uh, for the first time, he stopped trying to fight me on what humanity is and tapped into the potential windfall of knowledge I represent regarding mutantdom. And there was one th one thing over here that I forgot to uh, I skipped. She said in the, in the fifth one says, unlike my myself, um, observation uh, has not granted him perfect recall of my past lives, and I will not permit him to read me a second time. He is now to dependent on my interpretation of past life events so she's very very much playing puppet master it's not like she's given all of this knowledge to xavier and says here it's your turn you can go try and fix this she's like no i'm gonna let you in on what's going on you got that good anytime you need help or interpretation you come to me i'm playing puppet master with this i know how we fix this because i've lived through this 10 times right or nine times this is this is round 10 i know what we need to do and i love that and then um, she says they've successfully recruited Magneto. Um, they decided on doing uh, an island. I love this. Um, uh, of course, it has always been there, but seeing so many lives where an island or a world or some other celestial body functions as a safe haven for mutants has left an indelible arc. So, you know, you've got Genosha, now we've got Krakoa, there's like Asteroid M, uh, Island M, all that fun stuff. Talking about um, Apocalypse made himself known to the world. Um, and, you know, how they're going to have to kind of try to keep him at bay until they're ready uh, to pull everything in. Um, and then this one is, or they, uh, 48, they go to uh, Xavier, or they go to Sinister, I'm sorry, which was ahead of Moira's plans, and she kind of admonishes them a little bit. Then in entry 52, it says, We have lost Magneto. I had hoped, given the opportunity to help um, make him a better man, instead, we have all always made us an enemy. Um, so that's interesting. I don't know where in that. Where in this whole story she lost Magneto, maybe it's you know some previous X Men story. Although I think, or at least my my theory, or my working theory would be that everything we see here is completely fresh, completely brand new. Uh, I don't know how much previous X Men history plays into all this, or if it's wrapped up in those previous lives. Continuity is really squishy, but hey, it's X Men. Where would we be without a little bit of squishy continuity, right? Um, and then I love this. Um, she says, I decided to remove myself from the world. I've become too attractive a force in this, and I put both myself and our plan at great risk. So they fake her death using a replica, and now she will return to the shadows where she belongs. And that's when we go to uh, back to her no space that we saw in last issue. And they bring her tea, and I love this. She's like, uh, there's two entries to this place that I live. One is up to House of X, where you guys are. And the other one is to one of mankind's greatest culinary cities. I don't need you to bring me tea. I can go get my own tea. Screw you, right? And so they say, uh, 
and the, you know the, basically there's something else i need to talk about she's like ah it's tea and and other things and can i assume we now have a government and they basically tell her about the formation of the quiet council and who's on there and that they have yet to pick a red king uh, which is the one empty spot which was redacted in last issue which i think a lot of people are thinking it's or maybe it's confirmed that it's kitty pride which i actually really like um so um you're talking about you know how uh, emma picked um sebastian shaw to you know keep kind of hellfire uh, you know, keep everyone on a short leash, but I think it'd be interesting if Emma was the one that picked Shadowcat, because they've always had kind of an adversarial relationship, and I especially remember that in Joss Whedon's uh, Astonishing X-Men, so maybe, like, Emma picked Kitty to have that foil, that kind of Xavier to Magneto foil, um, to kind of, you know, you know, iron sharpens iron kind of thing, um, I, that'd be really cool, right? So they finish going through um, all of their choices, right? And then this is where we cycle right back to um, the events in House of X2, where we uh, first realize that Moira is a is a is a, is a mutant. Um, they got Mystique to join the Council because they promised to bring Destiny back, and Moira was like, "You can't do that. You can't do that at all." And Charles is like. We know. And then she says, there can be no precogs on Krakoa. We cannot, will not tolerate mutants he can, who can see the future. And Xavier's like, we know. <laughs> she says, you don't understand. Uh, she has ways of seeing me and I am a weakness because of my, because my death ends all of this. Yeah, we know. Right? I love how Xavier has to keep saying, we know, right? So they'll, they'll put it off as long as they can. Um, and that the truth is, that she's worried, one, that she's worried about if they bring back Destiny, she'll figure out Moira. But the, the, again, she's worried about any precogs because they'll know the truth that they always lose. So it sounds like they're still, you know, it feels like or that Life 10 is where they're trying, they're playing to win, right? They're finally playing to win and they, fi they figured it out. But it also, also feels like, again, they're playing not to lose, which is very different. Playing not to lose, if you're, if, to use a sports analogy, I'm not much of a sports guy, if you can't tell. Um, but there's a big difference in playing to win and playing not to lose. And playing not to lose usually ends up with you losing, right? And so then Xavier says, the truth is, until now we have always lost, but this time it's going to be different. Magneto says, for we are different. Whew, good stuff. I think this is very interesting. This I haven't never noticed it before, but the dichotomy of their colors. There's a lot you can say for character design and colors. And now Magneto is the one in white and Xavier is the one in all black. That's very, very interesting, you know, maybe informing some of their character traits uh, a little bit at this point. Very interesting. I don't know if I'm reading into that. It was just a very striking, striking panel. And so we have um, uh, some images that we saw last issue of the big party, or maybe it's something a little dirtier going on from what was being said uh, around the internet. And so the Xavier and Magneto are talking about how it's maybe time for Moira to step aside and let us do the good work for which we were created. And so uh, there's this scene again of Xavier and Magneto standing at the edge there and saying, just look at what we made. And I can't help but think that maybe if they're shunning Moira a little bit, that it might be that might be part of why they ultimately fail, right? Part of why they lose. And so they, you know, keep talking. They say this is basically just the, the kind of beginning. And uh, Magneto says, uh, I'm not ashamed of what I am. Let them try and stop us this time. And Xavier says, yes, let them try. And it's the end of the book. And we get just another great shot of the end of that that party. Looks very Endor to me. Like the end of Return of the Jedi where the Ewoks and every all the rebels are having a big party. And there's X-Wings dropping fireworks and stuff like that. But in this one, we've got all the uh, mutants that can fly up, flying around the trees and stuff. Just amazing, amazing stuff. And then the rest of the book is just kind of uh, previews and uh stuff for the dawn of x stuff which i just cannot wait for right so guys we are at the end we are at the end of hawks pox it was an amazing run um i absolutely loved 
everything about Hawks and Pox, but I cannot wait for Dawn of X to jump into all seven of these new series. Um, we're going to get six of them between next week and the middle of November, I think, over the next four weeks or so. Prepare your wallets, guys. It's, it's going to be a rough go. Uh, I know I've cleared off some space on my pull list to to dive into a Dawn of X. It's been a hell of a time. I, I, I might have the time to go back and reread all of Hawks and Pox. I don't know. I don't want to commit to that. I would like to and maybe bring back some more thoughts now that we know everything and kind of put the puzzle pieces back together. It's like watching a really twisty movie. Once you get to the end, you want to rewatch the whole thing and see what you missed. I don't know if I'll have time to do that, but uh, it would be super fun to do because this has been, like I said, an amazing ride. So guys, what did you think of Powers of Ten, Issue 6? What have you thought about this entire run? What are you looking forward to most in Dawn of X coming up? Drop all those thoughts and comment comments like you always do down below the video in that comment section thank you guys so much for watching if this is your first time here at the channel please hit that subscribe button for me it would mean a lot and until next time we'll see you at the comic shop